are you guys doing tonight? Good. Can we get a cheer for Swedish berries? Okay, and a cheer for uh, Fuzzy Peach. Well, I don't know. For the record, Swedish berries are far superior. All right, <laughs> boo. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Robin. I'm the pastor here at Lift Church, and I'm excited to open up the scriptures this evening. If you have a Bible, flip open to Ruth, the book of Ruth, which is right after the book of Judges, and right before the book of First Samuel. It's kind of in the first quarter or so of your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you'll find one just like this on your chairs, I would strongly encourage you to read along. Let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you speak through the scriptures. Every week, God, we have the privilege of opening them up and studying them and asking ourselves, what are you saying to us as a church? So God, we ready our hearts to receive from you this evening. God, I pray that my words would be would be for naught, but your words would speak tonight. That your scriptures would speak, God, that you would challenge our thinking and challenge our hearts and draw us closer to you. Amen. So I wanted to say a quick note about this series that we're in and why we're preaching it the way we're preaching it. So we're in a series called Bestseller. And what we're doing is looking at the best-selling stories of the Old Testament in particular. Now, many of us know some of these stories, many of us do not. But what we want to do is we want to unpack these stories. We want to dive into them and look at each of these stories. We're looking at eight weeks of stories, with each story being examined as a whole. So when we study the scriptures, there's different ways we can read. If you take the theology class that we do in the fall and in the winter, we go into this, how to study the scriptures. Now sometimes when we study, we want to unpack short sections of verses and really pull things apart. You know, you open up Paul's letter to the Romans and you read the first verse and you're like, boom, okay, I got to study this. So the, the gospel of John, boom, I got to really study these short little sections and, and work our way through them. Other times, it's much more of a narrative. There's a story being told. And in order to understand what's being communicated, we need to study the story as a whole. So, for example, in the book, uh, sorry, when we were studying Joseph a couple weeks ago, we, we, we saw this. When we come to this bizarre story of Tamar and Judah, it's kind of, it doesn't seem to make any sense. But in the context of the whole narrative, it all of a sudden does begin to make it a whole lot of sense. Now one of the challenges we have is that, for example, tonight we're looking at the story of Ruth, which is an entire book of the Bible. Now the story of Ruth is four chapters. I'm not going to stand up here and read four chapters, right? I don't think anyone wants me to stand up and read four chapters of the book of Ruth as much as I would love to. It'd be the easiest sermon ever. So what we're doing is we're very quickly trying to introduce the broad narrative and then sort of pull out key concepts from these stories. The truth is we could do a whole series on any one of these stories. Now, what this means for you is that you have a responsibility to go home and continue to study. See, my job as a preacher isn't to read the Bible for you. Right? My job as a preacher is not to read the Bible for you so that you can come to church and get your weekly dose of scripture. My job is to open up the scriptures and try and spur you to read the Bible and the scriptures for yourself. So my hope is that you would do that, that after tonight you will go home and read the book of Ruth. It will take you about 25 minutes and it's a cool story. All right, is everyone tracking with me tonight? Word. Oh, oh no, I just lost my spot. So what we're doing is we're going to go through the story of Ruth. So the story of Ruth picks up just towards the tail end of the period of Judges. So last week we talked about Samson. Samson was a judge, one of these civil and religious leaders in Israel. Not quite like a king, but more like somebody that governed the people and tried to bring some measure of order. So we're coming to the tail end of the, the season of Judges, right before Saul becomes king, which happens like three pages over in the book of Samuel. Now, we pick up the story with a woman named Naomi, not Ruth, Naomi. And what happens with Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, blah, blah, say that ten times fast, 
is there's a famine going on in the land. So they, they, they have no food. And they've decided to themselves that they're going to move to Moab where they hear that there is food. And that's where we pick up the story, is they've moved to Moab. Now they have two sons. These two sons marry two Moabite ladies, Ruth and Orpah. Not Oprah, which incidentally, a little pop trivia thing. Oprah is a play on Oprah. Her name got messed up on the birth certificate. It was supposed to be Orpah, which is a good thing because Orpah is not a very nice name. Anyway, we're picking up the story. You gotta go read the you gotta go read the story for yourself to see why it's not a nice name. All right. Anyway, we pick up the story right after the two, the uh, Naomi's husband dies. So Naomi's husband has died. Shortly after that, the two sons die. So what we have is we have three widows in the land of Moab, and this is where we pick up the story. I'm gonna read a short section to you out of chapter one, starting in verse six. Then Naomi heard in in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me, her sons. May the Lord bless you with security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go with me? Can I give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and, re- and refuse to marry someone else? Just to I want to explain what's going on here. There was the, the concept was that when you married a son into a family, and then that son died, it was the duty or the responsibility of another son to step up and marry uh, his brother's wife. In other words, to step up and to care for her. It was a way to ensure that the woman would not be left widowed and unable to care for themselves. By the way, just a little side note, if you're into or interested in kind of a biblical vision of men and women and womanhood and manhood, this book is a fascinating sort of study on it as you get to see kind of God's heart for things uh, in the midst of a culture that was very, very confused. I'm just going to say that. Go back and read Ruth another time. So what Ruth is, so what Naomi's saying is she's saying, I don't have husbands for you. I can't find a husband for you. My sons, I don't have any. And even if I did have any, you're not going to wait 15 or 20 years for them to be old enough. Continuing, no, of course not, my daughters. Things are far be- be- <clears throat> things are far more bitter for me than for you, because of the Lo- because the Lord Himself has raised His fist against me. And again they wept, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The woman asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, which means bitter. She named herself Bitter. This is one really bitter lady. For the Lord Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? She's clearly blaming and angry with God for her circumstances. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in the late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. 
And you'll understand in a minute why I read that section. Because that section frames the key characters. It introduces us to their, their, their thinking, their attitudes, their perceptions that continue to influence the narrative for the rest of the book. So what happens in the rest of the book? These two widows have arrived in Bethlehem. They're poor. They have no food. So they go, basically, uh, Ruth gets sent out to go and beg for food in a man named Boaz's uh, farm. So as they're farming, as they're harvesting the barley, they drop sections of it, and she runs up behind them and kind of picks them up and collects it and heads back home. And she works all day and all night, and she really uh, impresses Boaz, the landowner, that, man, this lady is just crushing it. She is absolutely working so incredibly hard. She takes it back to her mother-in-law, who's just blown away. This is amazing. We have such provision. And then it turns out that this man, Boaz, is actually a distant relative of Naomi's. In other words, he can technically fulfill the role that one of her sons theoretically could have if she had any. So it's kind of the whole uh, principle of redeeming uh, your brother continues down the family line. So Naomi starts to get really excited. She's like, this is amazing. Boaz is going to be the savior. This is fantastic. And she starts to play matchmaker. Any of you have matchmaking mothers or mothers-in-law? Uh, yeah. My mother, just saying. If she ever listens to this, it's a shout out. So Ruth says, okay, you know, this is all right. I'm going to go and try and build a bit of a relationship with Boaz. So Naomi sends her back to Boaz and she says, after Boaz has finished eating and drinking and kind of doing his thing for the evening, and he heads back to sit amongst his grain on the threshing floor, the, plain with, the place where they were keeping the grain. When he heads back there to go to sleep, I want you to go and basically present yourself to him and basically say, I want you to redeem me. I want you to marry me, to be my husband, to redeem the family name. Boaz says, okay, they get into this sort of this complicated legal exchange where he says, well, technically there's somebody more fit. Check it out in chapters three and four. The short story is that Boaz then marries Ruth. But here's the key thing, and this is where the story ends, is that they then have a son. And this son is named Obed. And this son becomes the father of Jesse, who becomes the father of David, the king of Israel, who ultimately, and this is the craziest part, becomes the lineage through which Jesus comes. So you can see how important the story is. No Ruth, no Boaz and Ruth, no Boaz and Ruth, no Obed, no Obed, no Jesse, no Jesse, no David, no David, no Jesus. So that's the story of Ruth. What on earth does that have to do with us? This is a bizarre story. If you read it, culturally, it doesn't really fit in with our modes of thinking. <clears throat> right, we have... We have this weird sort of exchanges, these legal exchanges with, with marriage. We've got this lady who's incredibly bitter. But I want to draw out something very, very powerful about the way Ruth and Naomi interact. Ooh. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> Got a bit of a... <laughs> I've had a lot of things going wrong in a sermon, but that's a new one. <laughs> so you pick up this story. Ruth is a fascinating woman. She's a woman that has absolutely nothing going for her. Imagine your father-in-law dies. Now you've married interracially or interculturally. So at this time, this was a very complicated exchange. It means that not just, it wasn't just like, okay, you married, whatever. It meant of subsuming and kind of this assuming of each other's gods and becoming uh, this complex interaction, or sorry, interaction between cultures. And what's happened is, is that Ruth has been left in a position where she has nothing going for her. Her, her, her father-in-law has died. Her husband has died. Her brother's husband has died. 
But I think the most fascinating part is that Naomi, the woman she is stuck with, is this incredibly bitter woman. Now, I don't know if any of you have experienced massive tragedy in your lives, but Naomi is a woman who has experienced probably the most horrific tragedy you can imagine. Her husband has died, and her two sons have died, and she has been left with nothing. My wife is the boss. <laughs> And the question is, what does Ruth do in the midst of a circumstance where she has nothing going for her? Where everything has fallen apart? How does Ruth respond in these circumstances? It's fascinating. Naomi comes along and she says, No, it is exceedingly bitter for me that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So these two ladies, they come along and they say, we're with you to the end, we're going to follow you to Bethlehem. And then she responds by basically saying, I'm so bitter, the Lord himself has come out against me. The Lord himself has come out against me. And my question for you tonight is, what voices are you allowing into your life that speak like this? that speak like, ah, there's nothing going right, ah, there's nothing good in the world. What voices do you have in your life where, that are dominated by bitterness and cynicism? See, something fascinating happens. Ruth commits to following Naomi, but Orpah turns back. And see, many of us are in circumstances where we're trying to navigate through something difficult, and then we run into someone like Naomi, who says, there's nothing going right. There's nothing going right in this world. There's no hope. The Lord himself is against us. And the, the thing is, depending who we surround ourselves with will depend on our response. The question is, are we allowing people who are bitter and inflamed and angry to influence our thinking and, more importantly, influence our perception of the character of God? See, Naomi instruction, she says, go back, worship your gods, go back to where you were. See, her perception of who God was had become incredibly, incredibly broken. And Orpah allows this broken and confused conception of who God is to become her definition of who God is. See, the truth is that the people that we surround ourselves with don't just influence our mood in that moment. They influence our perception of absolutely everything. Our perception of ourselves and our perception of who God is and what he is like. This evening I want to unpack Hebrews chapter 12 a little bit because I think this story helps it make some sense. Check it out. In verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 12 it says this, work at living at peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. And watch this. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. <laughs> see, when we allow roots of bitterness, when we allow our conception of who God is to become confused, or the conception of the church to become confused, it doesn't just influence us. It influences absolutely everybody around us. See, this is the way bitterness works, is that it's toxic. And what does Orpah do? She says, you know what? Our Moabite gods are better. I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to go home. But look at what Ruth does. Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. And here is the key phrase. Your God will be my God. So on one hand, Naomi is saying, this God that I worship is a God that is bringing calamity and he's awful and he's terrible. And Ruth is basically saying, no. Your God is not a God that brings destruction. He is a good God and I am going to follow him. You need to understand a little bit of the context of Ruth's response here. See, Ruth is not saying, I'm just going to follow my mother-in-law. She was voluntarily leaving her people. She was voluntarily forsaking absolutely everything that she had going for her. Why? Because she clearly understood that the God that Naomi worshipped, even though she was confused about who he was, was bigger and greater and more powerful than the gods of the Moabites. 
And the question is, when you run into bitterness, when you run into your cynicism, is your response to say, yeah, you know what, yeah, yeah, amen. Life is terrible. Life is miserable. Life sucks. My life is so hard. You know what? Everything's out to get me. Or is your response to say, my God is greater. My God is better. And I will follow him even when it hurts. Even when it's difficult. Even when I don't understand. It's interesting. I grew up in a family of mixed cultures. My mom is uh, South African. She grew up in South Africa. Very, very South African. My dad is Canadian. And I was reflecting on this. I was like, this is like my mother following my, my mother-in-law back to Canada from South Africa, leaving everything along with my dad dead. I'm like, that would never happen. It would be so incredibly difficult and challenging, but why does she do it? Because she's had an interaction, she's had an understanding, and she's clinging to a truth about God's character. That the circumstances that Naomi is allowing to define her understanding of God are not the final word on who God is. See, but what we tend to do is we allow our circumstances to define who God is. Right? We take whatever's happening around us and that becomes our understanding or our definition or our framework for understanding God rather than the other way around where God does not move. God does not change. God is sovereign and our circumstances need to be subject to that. So your job is to remain faithful to who God has revealed himself to be in the scriptures. And the option to become bitter and angry and inflamed with God, with his church, with what he's doing in your life is simply not an option. Because when we allow people around us to influence us into, our, into defining who God is, what we've done is we've moved from allowing God himself to define who he is, who he is to allowing whoever we're around. And this means that we have to understand where our understanding of God comes from. It comes from the scriptures. See, Naomi and Ruth had the scriptures it had been revealed to them. God had revealed himself to them. And Ruth would have understood this and said, no, God is a God that redeems. God is a God that pulled the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, and is bringing them forward to redemption. That is the God I'm going to follow. We'll come back to the story in a minute of why it was so broken and messed up in the first place. So Naomi and Ruth arrive at Bethlehem, right? And they're poor. They have nothing going for them. So fortunately, there was a law in the land that allowed them to go and glean, is the phrasing, glean, which means basically to pick up the scraps in the fields. And they're very grateful for this. But Ruth arrives in Bethlehem. You have to understand, she's a Moabite. Now, Moabites were a nation that the Israelites were expressly forbidden from having relationships with. These were not a people that, that the Israelites were supposed to be friendly with. And she comes up with this brilliant idea. She says in verse 2 of chapter 2, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, after Boaz. So she basically says, I'm going to go and beg as a foreigner, knowing that I'm a person that should never beg because I'm not even supposed to be here in the first place. So what does she do? It says in verse 17, so Ruth gathered barley there all day. And then when she got back in the evening, she beat the grain and filled an entire basket. Meaning, she went out and she worked her tail off. She worked and worked and worked and worked to provide for this bitter and angry mother-in-law. See, Ruth had every reason to be crippled by fear. We read later in the story that there was a high probability that she would have been attacked and injured or assaulted in that situation by making herself vulnerable. She had every reason to be a woman crippled by fear. So if the first challenge that she had was that she had every reason to be angry with God, or so it would seem, and she has this bitter, angry lady who's confusing her understanding of God, the second challenge is that she has every reason to be crippled by fear. To be crippled by fear. Fear. 
Maybe it was the fear of inadequacy, feeling like she's a foreigner, this lady in a strange land that does not belong, that she shouldn't be there. See, I think many of us have circumstances in front of us, but we're afraid to act because we are crippled by fear. We're crippled by fear of our own inadequacy. Maybe crippled by fear of not feeling like we have enough intelligence. Maybe crippled by fear by, of feeling like we don't have enough connections. Maybe we're crippled by fear because we're so afraid of failing that we refuse to act on the circumstances that God has put us in. So what we do is we arrive in difficult or challenging situations like Ruth and Naomi and we refuse to act. We refuse to step out and say, God, what are you calling me to do? See, this is fundamentally a question for us tonight of identity. See, Ruth was a Moabite, but she did not define herself so much so as a Moabite that it crippled her ability to act. Again, she's demonstrating an understanding that God must be working in this for his good and for his plan. And so she steps out. She says, I'm going to go and I'm going to beg. I'm going to go and I'm going to provide for this bitter and angry mother-in-law. I'm going to go out and I'm going to do everything I can. And there's something fascinating about hard work when we step out and when we take a risk. Now, I've, in the past, I've often talked about the American dream and how much I don't like it. How it kind of provides this incredibly individualistic view of the universe. But there's something fascinating in the scriptures. And it's this, that God partners with us. Very, very rarely does God act independent of human action. Very, very rarely does God move where his people are not also moving. See, the truth is, unless you're willing to put yourself out there, unless you're willing to take a risk and say, God, I believe that you're going to help me accomplish great things, you will not be able to accomplish anything. See, God's not going to supernaturally enter into your circumstance or your bedroom one day and be like, I'm trying to think of a name, Jimmy! <laughs> I want you to go and make wells in Africa. Or whatever. Right? We have to be willing to step up and take a risk, independent, independent of our fears of inadequacy, independent, independent of our fears of rejection, independent of our fears of failure. At Lift Church, one of the things we believe is in the power of experimentation. We're constantly trying weird and wacky and bizarre ideas. Why? Because unless we're willing to take risks as a church, unless we're willing to put ourselves out there, we will never, ever see the kingdom grow. Because God in his providence has said, I am going to partner with humanity to bring about hope to the world. And our job as a church, listen to me tonight, our job as a church is to take action, to be a church and a people of action, to not be a a church and a people of passivity saying, oh God, why isn't the church growing? Or why is it? No, we are a church that steps out and we say, we will take a risk for the kingdom, believing that God is going to build his church. And for this reason, we work hard. Like Ruth, for this reason, we work all day and all night. Not because our work somehow makes us awesome but because God has designed us to be a people that work in partnership with him. Now, returning back to our friend Naomi. Now, she's this bitter, angry lady, but check it out. In verse 20 of chapter 2, her whole tone completely changes. May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. He's referring to Boaz, who has been very good to Ruth. So she is referring to Boaz. May he, be, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness is not forsaking the living or the dead. In other words, he's, she's saying, God's kindness hasn't even forsaken my dead husband or my dead sons. Her entire tone has changed. All of a sudden she's gone from, the Lord is against me, his hand is striking against me, to the next thing, he's so kind and he's so good. Doesn't this describe us so, so often in our own faith? Where we're yo-yoing between God is awesome and I don't understand God and I'm angry at him and 
And I should clarify, sometimes it's okay to be angry at God. Go check out Jeremiah. He has some solid conversations with God. Same with David. It's good times. Right, but this is us. We're, we're constantly yo-yoing in this dysfunctional relationship with God where some days we're on God highs and other days we're on God lows. And the question for us tonight is how do we learn to live with consistency in our relationship with God? How do we learn to live with consistency where we're not yo-yoing back and forth? The first thing is to learn to stop blaming God. To stop blaming God. So, there's a famine in the land. Right? There's no food. So Elimelech and Naomi say to themselves, well, we're going to move to Moab. So two interesting things about the story. Number one is that famine in the Old Testament almost always associates with disobedience on the behalf of the Israelites toward God. God made it clear in the book of Deuteronomy that he would use famines to say, guys, I want your attention and I don't have it. So in other words, the context that they were operating out of was already disobedience toward God. And what's their response to move to where? Moab. Where were they not supposed to move? Moab. Who were they not supposed to marry? Moabites. What do they do? All of them. They're just not getting it. See, the, the circumstances that Naomi finds herself in are circumstances she should never have been in in the first place. She should never have been in Moab. Her son should probably never have married Moabites. Why? Because he needed, God was deeply, deeply concerned that the people would get confused about who he was. That they would worship him and other gods and get confused about the one true God. He says, don't do that. The Moabites were particularly confused and evil. This is nearing the end of the period of Judges. If you read the book of Judges, we realize how confused in general people were. So in other words, the circumstances in which Naomi finds herself angry at God are not a circumstance of God's judgment on Naomi, so much as it is a product of decisions that Naomi should never have made in the first place. But what we want to do is we want to make dumb decisions. We want to do things that we know God is calling us to better. And then we want to say, God, why is my life a mess? I don't want to hammer on this too much because Matt hammered on it last week. But if we look at that verse again in Hebrews, work at living with peace with everyone. Work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Now the word holiness is a difficult word for us to work with. It's been wrapped in legalese and it's been wrapped in this sort of this legal understanding that holy means perfect. But the principle of holiness has less to do with legal perfection and more to do with intimate relationship with God. Check it out. Those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Those who are not holy will not be in relationship with God. Well, what's the product of not being in relationship with God? Confusion. Destruction. The consequences of sin are death, not because God is seeking to judge us, but because that is the right reward when we live out of relationship with God. And our job as a community is to refuse to accept status quo in our midst. To refuse to be like, ah, well, whatever. On one hand, we can't expect God to move, and then on the other hand, be complacent. On one hand, we can't we, we, can, we can be like Naomi. We can be like, why isn't God moving? Why is God so, so mean to me? Why is God doing this or that? And then on the other hand, living a life that we know is not what God, what God is calling us to. See, our conception and our behavior of our relationship with God needs to move from thinking of right and wrong and do's and don'ts and needs to center itself around relationship. It needs to center itself around who is God and how can I be in relationship with Him.
When we learn to do that, all of a sudden, the stability will come because it's no longer defined by our circumstances. Our circumstances become, come under the governance of God. They come under God's goodness because all of a sudden, that is the most dominant factor in our life. Instead of the most dominant factor being our circumstances, our most dominant factor becomes our relationship with God. And Naomi's problem was that her, her and her husband were making decisions fundamentally removed from relationship with God. So when she starts to say, why is God so mean? It's because she could not see God. Why is God doing this to me? It's because she could not see him. As the verse in Hebrews says, if the second, if the first truth or the first, first aspect to learning to have functional, a functional instead of a dysfunctional relationship with God is learning to walk in relationship with him rather than blaming him, the second is to understand that God is sovereign and that he is fundamentally a God of redemption. See, in this story, they go to Moab, and it's horrible, it does not go well. But Ruth, a Moabite, moves back to, to Bethlehem. And what happens to Ruth? She becomes immensely blessed by God. There's two women that are labeled or named in Jesus' genealogy when you open it up in the book of Matthew. The first is Rahab who it turns out was actually one of the, the mothers of the great-great-great-grandmothers of, Mo, of Boaz. If you're like, but it says mother in the text, I challenge you to go and do some math and do some reading. Story for another day. But Rahab was a prostitute. So what we have, first of all, is Boaz is descended from a prostitute. And on the other hand, Ruth descended from the people of Moab, where she would nev should never have come from. But what does God do? She takes these, he takes these two broken and messed up circumstances, and what does he do? He redeems them. He redeems them. And if we want to learn to walk in stability and in consistency in our relationship with God, we have to learn to accept that God is sovereign, A, and B, that he is a God that redeems when I say that he is sovereign, it means that he ultimately is the one that moves and shapes and leads and, move and works on this earth. And he is the one who makes the decisions, and it is he who we worship. And on the other hand, it's to understand that he redeems. That no matter the brokenness, no matter how messed up the circumstance, that he walks into and says, I can make good out of what you meant for evil. It's interesting that Jesus comes from Bethlehem, the same place where all of a sudden hope comes to Naomi. Ultimately, hope comes from the same place to the entire world, as N.T. Wright says. So we come to the book of Hebrews, and I want to read the preceding verses. Hebrews 12, starting in verse 12. Therefore, Lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight the paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God so that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many will be defiled." Lift up your drooping hands. Strengthen your weak knees. Why? Because we have a God that redeems. We have a God that is sovereign and a God that is good. Let's pray tonight.